so we are so excited. We Chicks on Flicks is back. This is so exciting. Yay! <laughs> Yes, if you don't remember, because it has been a little while, uh, <laughs> me and my friend Christine get together every so often that we can, and we talk about uh, movies that we like, or yep. occasionally movies we don't like. We just talk about movies <laughs> and everything in between. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we're kind of since we're sort of rebooting this series a little bit, you might say. Uh, we're going to try to try to focus on some female directors in the future. And, and so I'm so thrilled to be talking about one of my favorite <laughs> female directors and uh, one of my favorite just people ever. Well, we're going to be talking about Nora Ephron and one of my favorite movies ever. We're going to be talking about <laughs> You've Got Mail and I'm so excited, but before we do all that, I should, we should just, we should just, uh, chat for a second. Like, how have you been, Christine? Oh my goodness. Crazy busy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have just been kind of honing in on a lot of writing goals. I started writing a new novel and I got about 10 chapters in oh. and then I decided to take a little break because I'd spent about 10 years working on a novel that I wasn't going to be able to pitch yet because I decided it was number two in the book series instead oh. of number one so uh, that's the 10 chapters I'm into it's, it's the new number one and I was like you know what I would like to actually finish something and pitch it that would feel nice so yeah right now I'm doing short stories because that's just a lot more manageable and I'm just kind of taking a break and letting myself breathe and yeah also letting some of the ideas for this new book percolate and it's been making me really happy, but really Well, you too. can take inspiration from Nora Ephron because that's how she got started was writing essays uh, in particular. I didn't even know that. Yeah. She wrote for, she was a columnist originally and uh, wrote essays and, uh, and uh, then uh, got into screenwriting and into, and then eventually directing. And her books of essays are, uh, are so fun i love her books of essays they're so wow. fun yeah like she her, her her first one is still my favorite uh, it's called off i feel bad about my neck oh and yeah my mother-in-law was telling me about that it's so fun uh, my sister didn't like it she's like oh it was like rich people problems but like i feel like for me i feel like nora friend would be like yeah it is rich people problems but She's, you know, I don't feel like she's taking it that seriously. It's just, just like mm -hmm. fun little, uh, little things about her life book is called, I remember nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that's charming. And, uh, anyway, she's, she's great. I just love her. And, uh, <laughs> and this is, it's interesting that you like this movie getting back to you've got mail because you're in general, not a romantic movie fan correct especially romantic comedy mm -hmm. unfortunately yeah. yeah well actually now I'm thinking about dramas I really like um Ghost with Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore that's probably my favorite romantic drama mm -hmm. um but yeah I get really really picky about the romance and I'm it's terribly picky about romantic comedy for some yeah. reason yeah Clearly, I'm not, as I like watch like, 95 Hallmark movies a year. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, I I understand, and so that's why it's going to be really cool to talk about this one and see why, compared to others, it yeah. rings true for you or that you enjoy it. Uh, the first thing I wanted to ask is: Have you seen the original film, The Shop Around the Corner? No, I have not. And I even know about it too. <laughs> I've never watched it. Yeah. It's really cute. And I, I understand there are some people who prefer it over this. And I, I understand it without being, I don't want to spoil it uh, because it does, it does make some weird 
choices. <laughs> that I mean, the mm. core is the same about these these two people that are in this case it's pen pals because Jimmy Stewart and then this other woman I forget her name. Uh, that but they work together, but they don't know that they're also writing each other. They hate each other as coworkers, but they're actually <laughs> in love. Super cute. But there's just some like really strange stuff like i don't think this is a spoiler but like <laughs> the whole thing is set in budapest for like no reason at all and like <laughs> that's really and it just goes to some like dark places <laughs> odd ways. And it's really good though i love it oh my goodness yeah i should have done my homework <laughs> oh i should have watched it before that's we had okay, this conversation that's okay. Uh, you'll have to just let us know what you think uh, if you if you get to see it. And it's more okay. Christmas. It's a little bit more Christmassy, I would say. Like, whereas like you've got mail has a little bit, but I would I think I could confidently say Shop Around the Corner is a holiday film. Uh huh. Like. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it is a remake of the this film Shop Around the Corner, and in my opinion. It is one of the best remakes ever. I mean, of course, I love it. So, of course, that's true. But, but you know, remakes are, are, are hard to do. Uh, but mm -hmm. I, I just feel like uh, it, it, uh, it's just a really, really solid, um, you know, taking this basic story, this basic concept, mm -hmm. and, and then updating it to modern times. And this is something that Nora Ephron pretty much did with almost all of her films like uh, i mean certainly you have in uh in sleepless in seattle all of the references to an affair to remember uh mm -hmm. that uh, it's not like a remake but it's very you know there's just a lot of uh, a, a love letter to let like you might say um and then mm -hmm. uh and then the same thing with it's not it's a Nora Ephron written film in when Harry met Sally which has a lot of a lot of discussions about movies and we'll talk about that here as well but you know they talk a lot about Casablanca in that movie and uh, uh you know a bunch of other films and so uh that that was there's a really there's some really good uh behind the scenes uh, or bonus featurettes or whatever in uh you've got mail and and uh one of the things she says is that uh that it's not necessarily that her movies are not necessarily about falling in love but they're about falling in love with the movies mm. and <laughs> that's really true her her movies and um i guess i, I do you like uh, since you don't you're not a big romance fan how do you feel about it, those other films like slippers in seattle while you were uh, not while you were sleeping when harry met sally do you have any yeah so i've never seen when harry met sally mm, okay um and i should <laughs> that's that's one of those movies that should be on the list um and sleepless in seattle i don't i don't hate it you know there's yeah. some romantic comedies where i just you know yeah. it's an eye roll the whole time sleepless right. in seattle is good and i've seen it many times my um older sister is a much bigger romantic than me and so she really liked sleepless in seattle um and i think it's it's fine i just don't know if it's as um like i feel like you've got mail is last a minute i find it so genuinely funny mm -hmm. and sleepless in seattle has more sadness behind it yeah. And I think that that's good, but like yeah. that story of his, you know, former wife who had passed away, it, it's so sad. <laughs> I um, I don't really even think of it as a comedy, to be perfectly frank. I right? I actually, I love her, what Nora Ephron, her description of grief and how she yeah. said, I get up every day and I breathe in and I breathe out and i I'm like that is so beautiful and and um really uh what she says in again in this uh featurette about she says that sleepless in seattle is about finding the right one like that's obvious like as soon as uh her character hears this person's sam's voice 
on in the radio she has this connection and she believes it is it's very high romance high you know that that it's a very romantic concept um and uh, they're they're not even together until the very very end of the yeah film, you know but there's this, this yeah finding the right one versus like settling for settling for something whereas she says in you've got mail it's about can you fall in love with in a way the wrong one <laughs> uh, yeah <laughs> that that you are right about you've got mail just being so funny so it it's <laughs> it's a really basic concept but you have meg ryan and this is now this had been their uh, meg ryan and tom hanks and this has been their third collaboration together on the screen and you can just tell how what chemistry they had together and uh mm -hmm. but yeah because they had joe versus the volcano and then sleep in seattle which they didn't really spend very much time together in but still and then and then uh in you've got mail and mm -hmm. anyway but yeah it's so funny there's so many good lines i completely agree with you mm. like, <laughs> i just love when uh, i love when he's uh talking uh talking to his uh dad about the about the store and he's like this uh <laughs> his dad's like there's pseudo intellectual you know west side you know and he's like readers dad they're called readers don't romanticize them. don't romanticize them <laughs> <laughs> so funny <laughs> oh. I, I i think i quote you've got mail more than anything um probably two lines one that caviar is a garnish yeah I don't know what it is about that line, but it just kills me. I don't know. I feel like yeah. it's so, like, who finds that funny? It's a very specific type of person. Um, but, like, when I'm preparing a meal, if I stick something on to make it look a little nicer, you know, I'm just like, that caviar is a garnish. <laughs> and then the other line is, I was eloquent. Shit. <laughs> I just die. Like, I yeah. don't know if I've ever related to a movie quote more just in my <laughs> life. Like, I feel like that experience happens a lot where I'm like, I'm putting everything out there. I'm, you know, generally a well-spoken person. And then sometimes it's like, you just get misrepresented and it's not yeah. even because people misunderstood. Yeah. It's because they don't like you and they want to misrepresent you. Yeah. And that's this unfairness that you know we experience in the world and that, that and just well and then just the um the irony well, of the line itself right yeah like i was eloquent follow up expletive yeah. you know, just, <laughs> oh yeah that is so, so funny i i mean dave Chappelle like just elevates as this you know this as these like sidekick basically character for the tom hanks character and they are so mm -hmm. funny together and like i love when he's like he's like i i don't want what if she sounds like the the mice in cinderella I, he's like he, you're just taking it to the next level <laughs> i always do take it to the next level yeah uh, it's so funny i love when like greg kinnear is like the whole cast of this movie is just amazing <laughs> so great i love greg kinnear when he's like a hot dog is singing you need quiet by the hot dog is singing <laughs> and then he's like he's like uh, uh yeah people fall in love with with <laughs> i mean people people spend buy leather jackets for way more than they're worth they don't fall in love with fascist dictators <laughs> <laughs> yeah i it's, love it's fantastic. <laughs> and jean stapleton a she's so great i felt fell you should fall in love with generalissimo franco so funny i love steel mm. steve zahn burns steve zahn and heather burns as as the people who work at her store and mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember when you thought Frank was the rooftop? I mean, Frank, when you thought Frank was the Unabomber? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, something like that, buddy. I'm going to the nut <laughs> shop where it's fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is obviously a movie that I really like. <laughs> like 
<laughs> I love this is really I, just gonna devolve yeah. into us quoting the movie essentially yeah <laughs> pretty much I also love when the great Kinnear character is having the interview with <laughs> the thank you interview yes uh, I, that's so funny and she's like oh Frank she's a Republican <laughs> I just can't help myself. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> funny. So good. Like those two actors are just in that interview scene are just, they do such a good job. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. Hilarious. I think. And <laughs> um, I love Dabney Coleman as, uh, as uh, Tom Hanks's dad in there. I think he's funny. Parker Posey as the is funny as, <laughs> As Patricia, <laughs> Patricia makes <laughs> coffee nervous. <laughs> it's like, if I ever get out of here, I'm having my eyes lasered. <laughs> I didn't know if this is for people to listen to because it's just me laughing at all this funny dialogue. But, but I just, I also love like little scenes where what <laughs> Efron does that's so great he writes like these sort of little essays you can tell she's an essayist at heart because she writes these mm-hmm. little essays but she just sort of works them into the story like you have her little thing about Starbucks about how like <laughs> it's not just a cup of coffee but a defining sense of self right yeah make seven decisions just order a cup of coffee that's really true it's really good and i mean she does that a lot in uh in when harry met sally there's uh but even here there's like little sort of mini essays about like the godfather and about uh you know i don't know uh the I don't know, just cute little like I, I when I when somebody does something that I like, I, I was like, if I knew your address, I'd send you a bouquet of sharp of newly sharp pencils. Mm-hmm. And like, well, and you know what's interesting too is I think for for instance, you have the line following up with if I ever get out of here, I'm gonna get my eyes lasered with where the hell are my tic tacs. Um <laughs> and that that line is actually really interesting to think about because Culturally, at the time when this movie came out, there was the super popular Tic Tac Breathe Fresh commercial happening. And that was kind of Tic Tac's big thing. So like, it, it actually kind of makes sense to have people in an elevator. And this is almost like a setup for a Tic Tac commercial, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, I feel yeah. like there was this very, very subtle, um, maybe, uh, it's just relevant. It was relevant. But the thing is, is even if people don't, watch this movie in 1990 or whenever it came out i don't know what year yeah. you know what year uh, what year was it uh it came out in i, I, I should 1998 i was gonna say 99 and then there I'm we go old. okay 98 <laughs> i was like no i was watching this as a teenager it wasn't 1990. um <laughs> but like the thing is is even if people don't know what that is it's still funny whereas compare it to something like moana right where maui yeah. makes the twitter cultural reference and the yeah, thing is is like part of that. that's not funny once it's outdated yeah the tic tac reference is funny even after it's completely outdated and no one even knows what this reference is for you don't even have yeah. to know what a tic tac is for that line to be funny i just think that's really interesting you yeah. know like that timeless right yeah and i think that partly might go back to it having that being this remake of this classic story i think that helps but also uh yeah i mean because like the technology is really dated in this movie you know the whole like aol you know dial up kind of thing and and Mm -hmm. stuff like that but it's it doesn't feel it doesn't matter at all. It doesn't affect it. I, I agree with you there for sure. Mm-hmm. Enjoy this movie just as like a really funny comedy with great performances. You can certainly enjoy it as a romance. Uh, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is I think that this movie actually has a lot to say about work. And I love movies about work. It's a topic that I, I guess because I don't have a family, like I'm, I, I don't have a f- children of my own like it's a uh, a topic that's 
near and dear to my heart, you know, and I'm very fascinated by what motivates us in our work, what motivates us to overwork to, you know, whatever. And it's just interesting to me because you talk to most people, say you're being introduced to somebody and you, uh, they say, Oh, here's, here's Joe. And what's one of the first questions most people say, what do you do? That's the first mm-hmm. question they're talking about work. They're not talking about like the blog you write in your spare time. Like they're talking about your job. And uh, so I know we're just so often so identified by whatever it is. That's our job. And uh, I think that that's a big theme actually in this movie. And you know, where her identity is so wrapped up in this bookstore because of her mother because of everything else it is in a sense her and he Uh say the same for him but it's not until he he and she are writing to people who know nothing about this identity that they really come to know themselves and that they really right you know fall in love which i think is i think is really interesting i don't know do you have any kind of thoughts about that yeah absolutely i Oh, there's so much there, right? Um, So here's one thought. I'll narrow it down. (laughs) Um, But to me, it's kind of, it's a really interesting microcosm of what we do on so many grander scales. Um, This same kind of conflict with people happens all the time with politics and with religion. I mean, they they even joke about it happening with politics with Frank, right? Where, you know, she's like, oh, is she a Republican? Because obviously he's not. And of course, you wouldn't love a Republican, right? Because you're not one. And so there are two teams here and she's not on yours. And yet we have this show where two people have the, the team jerseys removed and all they have are their thoughts to share. That's a good way to put Um, it. Right? And Mm -hmm. so I think it's just really kind of a beautiful thing. It's a very apolitical movie. I mean, they're not, they're, they're not saying like, Oh, you know, we're, (laughs) we're representing warring countries here or anything like that. Um, But it's applicable. It's applicable on a very grand scale of, of what really happens to people when they get to know each other, when they get to know their actual essence. And that's kind of where the line becomes really significant when um, uh, Catherine Kelly talks about how all these little nothings meant so mm-hmm. much more than something. Yeah. Yeah. Because the thoughts that we have and the emotions that we have and the experiences that really touch us, that we choose to share, those aren't nothing. We're taught that they're nothing. And we're taught that everything else, all of these other affiliations are team Jersey. That something yeah. that's what matters that's what you have to have in common in order to get along and this that's, movie just usurps that whole thing yeah that is such a great way to put it yeah i, I completely agree that you got to be like team godfather or team <laughs> <laughs> or team pride and prejudice kathleen kelly is yeah and that that's really true that we put ourselves in these we define ourselves by things in, in these sort of social camps these you know and it, it's really interesting how that can be even true about the it's like I, I am always fascinated about group think like and it, it's amazing as, as somebody who's like lives on social media all day it, the like the the most bizarre allegiances can be found like I don't know just the one that <laughs> uh, off the top of my head is like lately you have like in uh you have like people who like who are like people who love the last jedi and people who think it's like the worst movie ever and hate it you know it's like and, and there's like these little like the way we sort of divide ourselves into these these like mini tribes you know in a way like i i agree like there's so many things like that you could say that about and uh and certainly like politics is obviously is in a way the most divisive and the most i guess important religion things like that big but um but yeah even things like opinions about a movie like 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 she says here like what is it with men and the godfather and so <sighs> so what <laughs> and, uh, i think that the two most important sort of 
line lines in the movie where you really get to the core of these two characters the first is from kathleen kelly when she says sometimes i wonder about my life i lead a small life well valuable but small and sometimes i wonder do i do it because i like it or because i haven't been brave and i mm. love that quote like i love i think about that all the time <laughs> because mm. i lead a very small life and uh, i mean i literally just like manage twitter and and facebook and pinterest accounts and i but i'm happy and i'm happy with my life and i know that i'm i feel good about my life but there are some times when it's like i think about that like do i do it because i like it or because i haven't been brave to like i don't know like become a congressman and try to change the world or become a teacher and try to like nourish new souls or whatever you know <laughs> be seen as like either braver or harder or like i i know sometimes i'll get on the am i contributing enough to <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so i don't know that's just that is a line that i really relate to and she goes on she says uh, so much of what i re see reminds me of something i read in a book when shouldn't it be the other way around mm. so i don't know what do you think about that quote well it it is it's a really it's a really profound thought, you know, and I like that the way that she phrases it is it just because I haven't been brave enough. Um, I mean, personally, I think that there are kind of two ways to live your life. There's intention and inertia. And inertia is just one choice is going to carry you to the next and you can let your life happen to you with inertia. It just keeps you going. Yeah. Um, and then you have intention where you can choose it. And the thing is, is you can do the same thing via inertia or via intention and it will feel completely different um like there there are just so many things you could apply that to yeah. um yeah and it will just change your experience it might not even change what you're doing you know i mean um i think a really quick place that you can see the difference between intention and inertia is with housewives Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if a woman has kids and then she immediately feels trapped and she feels like she has no other options or no other choice, so she's just going to stay at home with the kids, um, then you essentially have someone who's become a victim of their own life and, and, yeah. you know, and it's like, yeah. oh, well, they just kind of choose this like path of least resistance, which is ridiculous because like being a housewife is so hard, but yeah. <laughs> like, it's just a disaster. But then, you know, if you have a woman who's like, you know what, I want to do this right now. I am going to take this time with my children. I am going to beautify my home. I am going to create a life worth living right here in this spot. And I'm going to live this life with intention. Yeah. Um, it's a completely different experience. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting because... Um, you know, this is coming from someone who's had the opportunity to do a lot of like wild and crazy things, you know, and I, I love to travel and, and all sorts of stuff. And um, the thing is, is even traveling itself can be done with inertia instead of intention. Yeah, there are plenty yeah. of people who just have enough money to jump on a plane and then just be taken somewhere and they wait for other people to enlighten them or entertain them and yeah. give them a life changing experience. <clears throat> and they're complete jerks. Right. Like, you know, you, like you hate running into these people. They're the ones who are like, how many countries have you been to? I've been to 80, you know, and you're like, Oh, get off this bus. Um, yeah. You know, versus that, someone who, Oh, go ahead. No, that that's real. I love that thought. That is really beautiful. This idea of, intention versus in inertia i love that and you know my mom she she even has a book uh, the art of housekeeping and and that's how mm -hmm. you know, she really saw it as like she wanted to become the best 
at what she in her chosen profession like she really saw it as something uh, as far as being a, a wife and mother and house uh, housewife whatever uh home homemaker that's the word i want it homemaker and uh you know she, she most of her most of my mother's interests and hobbies revolved around that in some way or and i i, th I don't think that was entirely unintentional i think that it, it, it she you know learned how to love she learned how to knit and loved knitting she learned how to you know she loved to read she she, she loved what am i saying she still loves uh, uh my, my mother is very much still alive uh but uh but anyway she she just uh learned how to love learned how to love cooking learned how to uh -huh. love and and that was not necessarily true for her mother her mother uh, uh -huh. was a, a working woman who uh who struggled to enjoy some of these things about homemaking <laughs> so it wasn't uh -huh. like a natural thing for my mom like she 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 really made you know made that choice uh, to 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 think so i think that's really really good and uh and i mean i i guess uh, i've been in a spot in my life where i wasn't living the life that i was supposed to live it's not like i was doing anything mm -hmm. bad but it was just awful <laughs> and uh -huh. it was just a toxic place to be in and i will yeah. never allow that to happen again ever that will never happen in my life i just made myself a promise when i got out of that situation that i would never allow myself to feel that unhappy again and uh and i i'm proud that that i it's actually 10 years uh, mm. 2000, uh 2017 was 10 years from the day that i december 20, december 17th 2007 was the day that i quit the toxic job that was just so sucking the life out of me and uh and i haven't regretted it at all ever and uh i don't know it's just it's just interesting but i i think it's probably healthy to have those moments where you think um where you have those moments of introspection like kathleen does do I lead a small life and do I do it because uh, do I do it because I like it or because I haven't been brave? I ask myself that question mm -hmm. every so often. Mm -hmm. think, but the other, I think, key character moment that I love is from Joe when he says, do you ever feel you become the worst version of yourself? Is that a Pandora's box of all the secret hateful parts? Your arrogance, your spite, your condescension has sprung open. Somebody upsets you, and instead of smiling and moving on, you zing them. Hello, Mr. Nasty. I'm sure you have no idea what I'm talking about. I love this. I love this whole sequence when she's talking, and you know, she says, "Wouldn't it be great if? Uh, wouldn't it be great if I could give you all of my zingers?" <laughs> you could say, mm. and I. Uh, and he says, "I must, I must warn you when you have, when you finally have the pleasure of saying the thing mm -hmm. you mean to say, at the moment you mean to say it, remorse inevitably occurs." I, I love mm -hmm. that, but I, I just love that about Joe's character. That and and I, I think there are, you do have moments where you just like, you, you kind of feel like, oh, I become. I didn't want to be, you know, or I just, oh, why did I say that? Or why did I do that? Or, oh, and uh, I don't know. That's just a very human moment, I think. Yeah. Well, I, I relate. And it's funny because out of the two characters, I relate more to Joe. Mm -hmm. I feel my personality is more similar to his. And I have that uh, curse where I can come up with a burn <laughs> pretty pretty quickly <laughs> and um you know I've, I've always heard that quote where people say you know you won't regret the things you said you know more as much as you regret the things you didn't say and i'm like you know what no, no. <laughs> that's not me <laughs> i definitely regret the things i have said far more than the things i didn't say or the things i've done more than the things i didn't say because like my personality is very um proactive and I'm very assertive. I do not have an issue with that. Um, and when yeah, I slide out of assertive, I don't go passive, I go aggressive. And so 
I, I really relate to Joe just being like remorse will follow. And the thing is, is I think that his, the character's personality type and mine is the type where in the seconds before that comes flying out of our mouths, we think it's a really good idea. <laughs> like yeah. there's this intellectualism that happens where we've removed ourselves from the, the real relationship and, and from even the emotion and from that yeah. little warning in our heart that says, don't do this. <laughs> and, yeah. and I have this joke with my husband. I, I told him when we were first dating, I said, every single time I have ever done something remarkably stupid I have the literal thought not even the feeling the literal thought in my head yeah that would be a great idea <laughs> like word for word in my head <laughs> especially yeah. as a teenager I can't even uh, tell you how many times my little brain went yeah that would be a great idea yeah. and then I do it yeah oh I so yeah. relate to that very much <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, and it's, it's even more so like it's, it's even harder to avoid that temptation or to control yourself, uh, like as in online communication, like that even adds another development. Cause at least like oh. <clears throat> when you're at least maybe you might be kind of, and I don't think of myself as like a troll or anything like that, but there are times when I'm like, I should have just let that go. Why did I say that? And mm -hmm. I haven't, especially in the last two years, I have been like moderating myself a lot, like just because it's just mm -hmm. toxic. I, I just can't. But, but still, every once in a while, I'll be like, oh, why did I say that? Like, why did I just let that go? What, why did I, <laughs> whatever. And, uh, but, I, it's, 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 it is hard, but I also kind of relate to Kathleen's sentiment of like having, I do have sometimes have experiences where I'm like, oh, if I'd only said it that way, you know, like I, it'll, like I, I've said it and I'm happy with how I said it, but then like, I'm like, I don't know, like later on I'll be like, oh, this would have been an even better way to say it. Like this is a better <laughs> argument. This would have been a better point. Like you kind of think of like, oh, I could have used that or I could have said that. And you're like, oh, man. And uh, <laughs> that it, it is kind of satisfying when you have that one moment where you're like, I nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> but so I kind of relate to that. I, in fact, uh, sometimes, I don't know if you ever have those things where you like, in advance, you kind of, like, you kind of write the dialogue in your head of what's mm -hmm. going to happen. And I remember one time when I was in college, I had, uh, my sister and I were roommates and I had gone to Costco and I ended up spending like $200 cause that's way easy to do at Costco. Right. Oh and, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, uh, I, but then I was like, Oh my gosh, my, you know, Megan's going to be so upset with me that I spent all this money and whatever. And I was, and so I had literally like mm. written this sort of dialogue mm. in my head of like, mm. I'm going to say this and I'm going to say, well, I bought all these staples and we're going to be able to eat for months and blah, 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 blah. And, <laughs> and I, I had it all sort of planned in my head of how I was going to defend myself against her mm. accusations that she was going to make about me spending $200. Anyway, so she gets home and I'm like, I'm really sorry. I spent the $200. And, and uh, she was like, oh, you went shopping? <laughs> I was like that's great <laughs> she was thrilled <laughs> and uh, I don't know it was just really really funny and I it was, it was when I, was there, I realized I'm like I had like built up this whole dialogue in my head and I'm sure that's gotta happen sometimes in like in marriage and then things like that mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> um so I, I don't know. I just, I just think that Nora Ephron manages to get to the heart of these characters without, I don't know. She manages it. I think it's pretty remarkable that she's able to keep, particularly Joe, like keep him likable enough. Like it, it's, it's a really interesting thing because 
she manages to keep you feeling like yeah he kind of deserved to be reamed out by kathleen Mm -hmm. at the diner Mm -hmm. scene like he deserved it Mm -hmm. he'd actually done rude things and he had actually you know he deserved to get his ego hurt bruised a little bit but i think partly because it is tom hanks and he's just so darn likable you still like him <laughs> you know, like he's mm-hmm. never mm-hmm. i don't know it's a it's a type of act that i think they they do a good job walking. yeah so there's a book um on um screenwriting called yeah. secrets of story by matt mm-hmm. bird and um it's interesting because like i really like using save the cat by blake snyder and his whole series of books on writing Mm -hmm. and blake snyder kind of talks about how if you want to make a character sympathetic you give them a a moment of compassion and that first save the cat gets its name it's the trope Mm -hmm. where in movies the hero you know saves the cat so we all know he's such a good guy and that's supposed to make us like them in secrets of story Matt Bird, who, by the way, is like not a super famous screenwriter or anything. He's just a guy who's had a blog for like 10 years um, that I just really respect. Um, He said, I don't actually think that's how it works in movies. He said, I think the one universal emotion that your reader is always, or reader or watcher or whatever, is always going to connect to is feeling misunderstood. Mm. he's like if you can show how your character is misunderstood then your audience is going to want to defend them right because the other characters don't see what we see and I think it's really interesting that in this movie we're given exactly that to the point where you know he shows up for this blind date realizes it's Kate Kelly Mm -hmm. and doesn't tell her it's him and then he, mm-hmm. he shows up and she's like, oh my gosh, it's a Joe Fox, this guy I hate. And then she emails him about it, right. you know, <laughs> and he's so misunderstood. And so it's like all of these sins, while they're not good, we, we want to defend him because he got misunderstood and yeah. we can't bear that because no one wants to feel misunderstood. Yeah, that's really good. And the thing is, is he even misunderstands himself, I think. I mean, he he thinks mm. that he thinks that the Godfather is the way to live. Like he thinks it's not personal, mm. it's business. Like and uh and which is an understandable perspective, especially with the father that he has and, and you know, things like that. Like it's totally understandable. But he he realizes by the end that that was wrong you know or at least Mm -hmm. partly wrong (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, and uh and she you know she comes to understand i think because there are some people who are like well she she doesn't uh like how could she forgive him for taking closing her store you know with her mother being all involved or anything like that like how could she forgive him but like she was that's what i'm saying that's why it's so important to think about it as this the story of people who are so identified with their job but they fall in love outside of their job so if you think of it from that perspective of course she's going to forgive him (laughs) because he's the one person who really understood who she really was and even Mm -hmm. before even before she did you know like she thought that that was her life too and it wasn't until and i have seen so many movies particularly on hallmark channel where they i call it the save the barn story you know where it's like you gotta mm. come together mm-hmm. save the barn save the school save this you know whatever community center restaurant theater whatever and those stories are usually not great because mm-hmm. because you'd never believe for a second that they're really going to close the store there you never believe for a second that they're mm. going to go out of business and so it's just mm-hmm. kind of you know sometimes they can work because the car- actors are just so darn charming that it, it it works but for the most part i'm like so sick of that trope and the uh the thing about it that uh in this movie they close the the shop it's a safe yeah. 
the save the farm movie that actually loses. It's so yeah. Great. And so she yeah. has to. <laughs> and so she has to figure out what her life is and what matters. And I love when she says, "People always say that change is a good thing." But what they really mean, what what they're really saying is that something you didn't want to happen at all has happened. And Mm. (laughs) that's so true. You know, so she has to become this new, different person. She has to become, or she has to become the person that she was when she was talking to NY152. Mm -hmm. She she Mm -hmm. has to become that person that's not the store that's not her who she is and i don't know i just uh i just love i just love that and that's so i completely buy yeah. i completely buy the ending i really do yeah well and the thing is too is while both of these characters own their stores it's like they kind of don't there are mm. forces at work that they're not in control of um and there's another uh screenwriting concept um, that conflict occurs when an immovable object meets an unstoppable force. Mm-hmm. And in this movie, Shop Around the Corner is your immovable object. And then um, the Fox Books is the unstoppable force. Yeah. And conflict is like what happens with these. And the thing is, is it's portrayed, I think, pretty well that these characters couldn't just opt out. Right. Like, yeah. like, what is Joe Fox going to do if he's like, ma, let's save shop around the corner. I had a change of heart. Like, yeah. it's not even going to work, you know? Um, and, yeah. and with, uh, you know, Kate Kelly, she can't, she cannot let go of this job because like you said, it is her. Um, and <laughs> so I, I just think yeah, she even says that, her her mother that she feels like my mother has died all over again yeah that's pretty intense stuff that's pretty intense stuff. right yeah uh (laughs) it's it's so good there's and there's just so many there's so many sweet lovely little moments like i love when she's talking about uh when she's when she's talking about her uh her handkerchief and twirling with her mom i love when he brings her the daisies and mm-hmm. she's like, did you know that daisies are the friendliest flower like oh, so good and uh mm-hmm. he's like, yeah. uh and i i i mean there's it's just i just love this movie so much i i love her i even love her <laughs> wardrobe i love i wish i could mm-hmm. dress like kathleen kelly i think she looks so cute <laughs> and i i love the music it's so good i love the soundtrack i'll listen to it over and over i it ends with uh somewhere over the rainbow which is like my favorite song ever in the whole world mm-hmm. i love that i love that this movie is just like an homage to the west side of new york city which is a part mm-hmm. of it. i love it when i one time i went to new york my sister my sister my aunt was living in new york city on the west side you should have seen her she lived in with like three other people in this one bedroom apartment it was the smallest apartment i have ever seen in my life and Mm. it basically had like a like a bar kitchen like it wasn't even like a legit kitchen like it was the smallest apartment i've ever seen anyway Mm. but but uh but it was so fun like we went to grace papaya which is in the movie we went to the cheese store that is actually that 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 was um the the shop around the corner the the mm. uh the actual storefront is is actually a cheese store <laughs> oh interesting really yeah not a baby gap <laughs> not a baby gap thank yes thank goodness um and uh, you go to Riverside Park and just uh, so great. Are you, do you love New York? Have you been to New York? Are you a New York I went to school? New York when I was 14. So it was a long yeah. time ago, but I really, really loved it. Yeah. It's so fun. And I mean, this is obviously a very like 
Nora Ephron picturesque version of New York City, but I <laughs> I really love it. With most romantic comedies, or at least the ones I've seen, um, is you've got a couple uh, character trope types, right? Mm-hmm. So, and the male ones bother me more than the female ones. The males are either <laughs> like just a complete loser, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. like, and they don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even try. And it's supposed to make things more relatable, I think, or like the guy more relatable or or something, which is crazy because like demographically they make these movies for women. Yeah. So I'm like, what why you're not making it for a guy. This, this isn't uh whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Um and the guy is like in he's a man baby. There we go. He's, yeah, he's yeah, capable yeah. of taking care of himself. Yeah. Um and then the girl comes in and like, oh, he needs her. Da 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 da. Um, and then the other tropes you have are like, you know, well, in romances in general, you have like the debonair rich guy, but like they end up together at the end, but like, he's not a good person. That's weird. <laughs> um, or you, have, or you have Hugh Grant and I just don't understand. But, um, anyway, the thing is, is with this movie, like the Tom Hanks character, it's like, okay, he's, he's a full grown man. He can take care of himself, maybe a little too well, right? Because he's kind of callous. Yeah. But the thing is, is he's not the debonair rich guy who's going to just stay the same. He's not a static character, right? And the other thing, too, is, like, she doesn't fix him or change him. He actually learns from his mistakes and feels genuine remorse, and then that causes character change. So, to me, like, like, he's the type of person that you actually would fall in love with in real life. Like you might actually marry that kind of person who is going to grow with you, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and then with a female character as well, it's like, you're either going to have this, you know, model bombshell who doesn't know how to act um, <laughs> at all. Yeah. Uh, that's just like really, really beautiful. And I think they're, I don't even know. Anyway. And then, or you're going to have the manic pixie dream girl who's just mm, bopping yeah. around in the rain, you know, um, and teaching him how to love his life because that's the only thing he lacks. Um, yeah. <laughs> some people have actually named Kate Kelly as a manic pixie dream girl. I don't think she is. I no. think that she's the proto manic pixie dream girl. I think that she's what came before that fad. Um, because they were focusing on her being cute rather than gorgeous. Mm. Um, but then later, you know, Zoe Deschanel came on the scene and they were like, okay, now we're committed. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> anyway, what ar- were you going to say? Hard to argue with that. Uh, yeah, in my opinion, here's my theory on romantic comedies. I think that all romantic romantic comedies or that type of story, I think they are all either trying to be Taming of the Shrew or trying to be Pride and Prejudice. The thing with Pride and Prejudice that people forget is that is that both Darcy and Elizabeth are shown to be very likable characters throughout the whole movie in their interactions mm-hmm. with other people. So we know that they're good people. We know that they're respected. We know that Bingley loves Darcy. We know that many people respect him love him whatever and uh mm-hmm. and the same is true for elizabeth jane loves elizabeth her father loves elizabeth and so when they do these r- kind of rude things or are difficult towards each other we're rooting for them mm-hmm. and we want these people to find each other because we we like them as people and we want them to be so yeah, that creates tension that's why it works Mm -hmm. so many romantic Mm -hmm. movies get that wrong they try to do that and they just end up you're just like i hate these people these people are horrible Mm -hmm. (laughs) and uh, they they uh, forget that aspect of the story they think oh you just got to have two people that hate each other but they're like secretly in love and that Uh. that's not that's not what pride and prejudice does it's it's more subtle than that uh, but right. it's also two characters who are completely honest with each other, particularly in that time period. And, uh, and you know, so that's also, you know, partly what, what makes it work very much. And then as far as like the taming of the shrew side of it, and some people have problems with taming the shrew, whatever, but I'm talking about 
the core idea of the fact that Petruchio gets basically like dared. There's like a to to try to woo this person who is difficult and whatever. Mm-hmm. And so many romantic comedies have like a similar structure where there's some kind of gimmick that's going to force these two people together, and then like, oh my gosh, you were only in it for the bet, or you were only in it for the for the for part of your job or you're only in it for writing an article or you were only in it for whatever it might be you know even you could go back mm-hmm. to my fair lady like there's there's tons and those are extremely difficult to pull off the gimmick ones are very tough <laughs> you either mm-hmm. have to be very funny and i i personally think that shakespeare can pull it off because he's freaking shakespeare and it's funny mm. but usually it's like super grown worthy but like something i like uh my big fat greek wedding which is kind mm-hmm. of a gimmick you know it's this big wedding and everything but like to me the script is actually pretty funny and there's car- 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 there's um good chemistry and, you- and that's obviously essential in a romance you have to have good chemistry between the the lead couple Mm -hmm. and that's just one of those intangibles that like Mm -hmm. i don't know it sucks because it's casting you can't plan that it just either is there or it's not there but the rest of the stuff like um like with greek wedding it's just funny in my opinion it makes me laugh and it's some if somebody's from like a big family i can relate to it enough and you know weddings are insane and difficult and so it's good but uh but where the sequel was terrible, the Mike Big Fred Wings wedding sequel was awful mm. because it 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 was like it was just so ridiculous to have like it's one thing to believe like a, a big family being super involved in a wedding. That's something that's believable, and then they just like up up it a little bit beyond mm-hmm. for humor. They up it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the sequel, like the entire family comes to her college uh uh college night it's at the high Mm. school you know like that's not believable Mm. that's not funny Mm -mm. so so it just didn't work at all and um and plus they just take the jokes that worked in the first one and then just do them again and it's not as funny so Mm -hmm. anyway but that's what i think with romantic comedies i think everyone's either trying to be pride and prejudice and or taming of the shrew or at least like 95 percent of them are and uh and that's why so many of them doesn't don't work is they don't understand kind of what makes those two properties work and uh and, yep. so, anyway that's my spiel <laughs> yeah well and i think it's interesting too because even a romance including a romantic comedy i think and i'm just I, this isn't like a long-standing theory I've had. I'm kind of postulating it right here, but yeah. it's it seems important to me that there be some stakes other than the relationship, and that the stakes that are there are connected integrally to yeah. the relationship. So, like with you've got mail, the stakes aren't will they end up together or won't they? Yeah, the characters don't even have that in mind. They don't yeah. even know who they're talking to. Yeah. And so to them, the stakes are, will I lose my business or not? Um, yeah. Or will I squash this business or not? Um, yeah, that's and a so, really good but the thing point. Is, right? That it's so tied. Yeah. Like it, 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 you, can't, you can't have you've got mail without either of those two stakes, the relationship or the businesses. Um, yeah, and I mean, with, even um, with Pride and Prejudice, it's, there's, there's are a lot more stakes. Right. Like the fact that they're they could be like turned out at a moment's notice if her father dies. Like it, there's like so when she refuses, when when she refuses Darcy, that's like super brave of her. Like right because she's just seen what Charlotte just did, you know. Right to marry Mister Collins, and and you can only imagine what her mother and what other people would think. They know that she's refusing this this man. And, uh, and so it adds just this tension and the stakes and this things to the whole story because this character is being super brave and super honest. And, uh, and we can think, oh, it's just a romance. It's just about, but like the fact is, is like in that era, who somebody married was like 
huge. Like it wasn't just like, oh, romance, whatever. Like that was a huge, I mean, who you marry is always huge, but like for women in that era, like that was more than just romance. It was life. And <laughs> uh, it, mm-hmm. it, yeah, and for this is her whole family and everything. And so we forget that. And I mean, even something as silly as Taming of the Shrew, like this all of Catherine's decisions affected her, affected Bianca's decisions, affected, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, there's, uh, there's more to it, more to it than, than just, uh, just silly romance. Will they, won't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I agree with you. I think that's yeah. really true. That, and, yeah. And that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I do. I agree. Yeah. Well, and um, while we were talking about this, I was reminded of Ghost, which is my favorite, most romantic movie. Um, And it's not necessarily a comedy, although Whoopi Goldberg is comedic gold. I just don't know if that is like the tone of the whole movie, right? They don't sell it as a comedy. Right. Um, But the thing is, is the relationship happening is Patrick Swayze as a ghost has to connect with his girlfriend uh and 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 let her know that he is there and that she is loved (laughs) i'm like getting all emotional oh my gosh i love this movie so much and (laughs) that he truly loved her right that's the emotional stake but the thing is is it's all um in this framework of molly's life is in danger because she doesn't know that yeah patrick swayze was killed by his best friend and if she doesn't find out she could die, you know? And so like the stakes Stakes. are huge (laughs) and both of these things, the relationship has to happen in order to save her from this other major dilemma. Right. And you can't have one without the other. They are perfectly entwined. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's why in you've got mail, why it works because it's not just to save the barn story. They're mm-hmm. actually lost. There's a, the characters actually grow. They actually change. They actually have to, you know, like <laughs> uh, that uh, they actually experience conflict, and, you know, things. And uh, yeah, I, I completely, completely agree. I agree with you on that. Uh, and it's tough. Trust me. <laughs> nobody knows more than me that (laughs) this is very difficult to pull off uh this uh, it seems like it should be so simple to to make a satisfying entertaining heartfelt uh you know romantic movie but even Nora Ephron failed a number of times like there's a it's she is she was not perfect as a screenwriter or a director nobody is and uh um but uh even she sometimes had a hard time kind of keeping the characters likable and keeping uh you know she has there's one movie she has called hanging up which isn't really that much of a romance but you know she has a hard time in that movie uh keeping her characters likable uh and um uh, some of her other mixed nuts is a movie that she did that it, the characters really aren't that likable and it's just not funny enough mm. to mm-hmm. to work. Bewitched is another one that the characters are kind of shrill and awful and it's just not funny mm. enough. So even wow, I didn't know she did the Bewitched. Is that the remake you're referring yeah, to? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that was bad. It is, it's <laughs> not really great. Bad. It's not great. Like I can watch any of her movies and like. I don't, I don't hate them. I'm not like, oh, I'm in agony. There's like the worst movie I've ever seen, but it's not a successful film, Bewitched. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, it has some interesting, I see potential in there, like what they were going for, but it doesn't work. Um, but, uh, but so even Nora Ephron, my beloved, uh, <laughs> you know, didn't always hit it, but I think that You've Got Mail was, is, was uh, a, one of her definite hits and one I love, and uh, it it's, like, if I'm just talking about 
movies that are like rewatchable and quotable and I've seen and love, like it might be my favorite movie. If I'm, you know, just as far mm-hmm. as like, like I'm not going to tell you with a straight face that like, that You've Got Mail is a better movie than Lawrence of Arabia or, you know, or, or like something like that. Mm-hmm. But, but if we're just talking about like a movie that's given me joy and that I love and that I rewatch and that I, I, I just think is so quotable, I could have gone on even more. There's even more quotes that I could have talked about mm-hmm. and uh, more scenes that I love. And uh, it, it really might be my favorite movie. I just, I just love it so much yeah so, that's I was fantastic so happy to hear that you also enjoy it that you also love it and uh that you wanted to talk about it because i need no <laughs> uh i need no uh catalyst i guess <laughs> to talk about you guys yeah. <laughs> uh so anyway so thank you so much for uh, for joining me with this and uh, it's gonna be really fun if if people watching if or listening if you have ideas of women filmmakers or sort of we really want to champion uh, you know f- strong female films even if they we w- want to try to try to do that going forward so if you have suggestions of things that you would like please put in the comment section let us know let us know on twitter and you can follow us at chicks on flick on uh twitter and i will put a link down and uh, we'll try to start up that twitter get it kind of it's been kind of i haven't been really active on it for a while but we'll try to start that up again and uh and if people want to contact you how do how can they find you christine I have recently resurrected my website, ChristineTyler.com, <laughs> and from there you can find pretty much everything else with my social media and um, like if you click on the U- uh, videos tab, it'll take you to my YouTube channel and all that. So just ChristineTyler.com, super easy now. Great, awesome, yeah. and yeah, uh, you, you can find me at Rachel's Reviews on iTunes and YouTube, and also f- be sure to follow uh, me and my friend Amber on the Hallmarkies podcast. Uh, we are just having the time of our lives talking <laughs> about Lily Hallmark movies, and uh, so make sure you're following that. I think even if speaking of chemistry, even if you never watch a single one of these Hallmark movies, I genuinely think you could listen to the podcast and actually be entertained by it because I think we ha- we have chemistry and we, we don't take ourselves too seriously and just have fun. So uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I actually got to interview a, uh, a film critic, Alonzo Giralde, there, and, and there's another one named William Bibiani that we're going to be interviewing. And uh, that, so that was like a real, you know, we, we talked about Siskel and Ebert and how they were just such an important part of my childhood. So to be able to interview uh, critics that I, I love and respect so much uh, has been a real dream of my life. And so it's been, who, who would have ever thought, who would ever thunk it that a Hallmark mm-hmm. podcast would, would lead to so many cool things, but it has, <laughs> it really has. And uh, I love it. And so make sure you're following that. And, uh, and thanks again for talking about You Got Mail with me. I, I really appreciate it. It was so much fun. It was my pleasure. I love it. <laughs> thanks. So, all right. Well, we will talk again soon about a new movie. Okay. Talk Bye. to you soon. Bye.